and to the 130th Psalm. I won't tell you why this is important uh, until I get into the message of the morning, but it is important uh, in terms of how it connects to this theme of Aldersgate Sunday and the conversion of John Wesley. 130th Psalm reads as follows, and thank you, Joel, for putting it on the screen for us. If you'd like to follow in your pew Bible, it's page 614 if you would prefer to use the text. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to my cry for mercy. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, therefore you are feared. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits, and in his word I put my hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than watchmen wait for the morning, more than watchmen wait for the morning. O Israel, put your hope in the Lord, for with the Lord is unfailing love, and with him is full redemption. He himself will redeem Israel from all their sins." Lord, uh, we pray that this beautiful psalm, probably 3,000 years old, will have meaning for us who live in 2014, and that the words will not be just dead words on a page, but will be enlivened by your Holy Spirit. And we will thank you in your name. Amen. May the 24th will always be a special day on my calendar for two reasons. First, it's our granddaughter Olivia's birthday. It's hard to believe that our granddaughter Olivia will be 11 years old on this coming Saturday and at 11 years of age is already 5 feet tall. But uh, she's a special little girl. We love her so much. And she was born on... May the 24th. Now there's a story about what happened on the morning of May the 24th that goes something like this. May the 14th, May the 24th, uh, 2003. Uh, Catherine came into our room uh, early that morning and informed her mom that things were about to happen on that particular morning. Amanda Donaldson got a phone call to be with Catherine at the hospital and uh, I said to myself, and then I said to my daughter, which was probably a mistake, oh, that's great. This is May the 24th. It's the anniversary of John Wesley's conversion. Olivia's going <laughs> to... Catherine did not appreciate that at that moment. Which, of course, leads me to the second reason why May the 24th is so important. And that is that this Saturday will be the 276th anniversary, almost 300 years, of the conversion of John Wesley, the founder of Methodism. The story of John Wesley's life up to the time of his evangelical awakening, as the historians call it, we would call it his conversion or being saved, is the story of a man on a search for God. I'm fascinated by the early years, from 1703 to 1738, the early years of John Wesley's life. Brilliant man, 16 years of age, is in Oxford University, has a master's completed at Oxford by his mid-20s. He's ordained a priest in the Church of England, teaching at Oxford, and has all, all the elements of what we would understand to be a, a Christian life and lifestyle. Incredibly disciplined man, educated early in life and beyond his years. But it was not until 35 years of age and after he had served many years in Christian ministry that he discovered the reality of a personal living relationship with Jesus Christ. And that personal relationship began on May the 24th, 1738, 276 years this coming Saturday. Wesley, as I already mentioned, was meticulous in his life and lifestyle. And from 1735, three years before his conversion, 
1790, he kept a daily journal, which is volumes long, which, of course, the historians have poured over, still are pouring over, uh, as, as more and more research is done on Wesley and more and more PhD students are doing particular, looking at particular issues in his life. So for a period of 55 years, there is a daily journal of this man's life. The following entry is found on the morning of May the 24th, 1738. He writes these words. I think it was about 5 o'clock this morning that I opened my testament on these words. 2 Peter chapter, 4, verse, 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 4. Through these, Jesus has given us very great and precious promises so that through them you may participate in the divine nature and escape the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. So Wesley, again not sure of his own salvation, opens up the scriptures at 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 4, and there's this promise that through Jesus, what he's looking for is possible, entering into what Peter calls there the divine nature. Just as I went out of the house, I opened it, again the New Testament, on these words, Mark 12, verse 34, you are not far from the kingdom of God. Now remember, this man is teaching at Oxford. He's been a missionary in the, in the country of, in the new founding uh, colony of Georgia. More about that in a minute. And yet, he hears these words from Scripture, you are not far from the kingdom of God, and feels, recognizes that they're speaking to him. That afternoon, the, the afternoon of May 24, 1738, John Wesley was invited to go to St. Paul's Cathedral in London, the very St. Paul's Cathedral where all the weddings and all the other things still take place, the very same place. Now, again, at that time, there's services all day long in the Church of England. There's morning, there's afternoon, there's evening, even though it's not a Sunday. So the choir at St. Paul's Cathedral on the afternoon of May the 24th, 1738, sang a psalm, which is again still to this day part of Anglican liturgy often. And the psalm that they sang was the 130th psalm. Now, I want to go back, Joel, if you'll put it up again, I want to go back and read the 130th psalm. In the context now of these are the words that John Wesley hears on the afternoon of May the 24th, 1738, before the events of that evening take place. Listen to the words again. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to my cry for mercy. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, therefore you are feared. I wait for the Lord, my soul waits. And in his word I put my hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than watchmen wait for the morning, more than watchmen wait for the morning. O Israel, put your hope in the Lord, for with the Lord is unfailing love, and with him is full redemption. He himself will redeem Israel from all their sins. This 130th Psalm is called a penitential psalm. It is a cry for forgiveness. It's you or me saying, help God, I'm carrying around this huge weight in my life. I feel estranged from you. I feel guilty. I know I need forgiveness. That is what marks the first of the four sections of this psalm. The first two verses are commonly called the address to God. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to my cry for mercy. I'm guessing that you have felt that way at some point in your life. It may not have been the issue of sin, which it is in this penitential psalm, and which it is in the life of John Wesley. But someone here this morning is feeling that, out of the depths, O Lord, I cry unto you. 
because somewhere in all of our human journeys, we will experience that experience of just saying, God, where are you? The psalmist felt that depth, nowhere to go, as deep as the pit can get, a hopelessness that is just pervasive in the spirit. So what do we do when we're in the depths? Again, this is a penitential psalm, so it's speaking directly to the issue of sin, but it has implications for so many other aspects of our lives. What do we do when we're in those moments? We cry out to the Lord. O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to my cry for mercy. Why cry out to the Lord? Why not take up yoga or transcendental meditation or uh, listen so, to some new age music and get your life centered? Well, the second section of the psalm answers that question. The first two verses, the address to God, verses 3 and 4, the statement of affirmation of the nature of God. So he goes from this cry to now... I'm addressing you, God, because this is who you are. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? So, God, you are holy. There is no one like you. You alone are holy, as we have sung this morning. If you kept a record of sins, no one could stand. But with you there is forgiveness, therefore you are feared. God knows who we are. We are sinners. That's why the depths are so deep. And if God kept a record of sins, not one of us would have a hope. All have sinned, Romans chapter 3, verse 23, and fell short of the glory of God. Susanna Wesley was, again, a remarkable person. Her maiden name was Ansley, Susanna Ansley Wesley. Her father was a Puritan minister. And uh, John Wesley picked up some of her ideas in, in his writings. And, and you see the influence of his mother, especially after his conversion. But even before his conversion, uh, there's correspondence going on between his mother and him. And here's a letter in, on June the 8th, 1723, so 1725, 13 years before his conversion. Wesley, even as early as, the, as this period of time in his life, is wrestling with what it means to be forgiven. And that becomes the issue that defines Methodism and its contribution to uh, Christian thought. So his mother and he are writing back and forth. And the question becomes, what is sin? And this is what Susanna Wesley writes to her son John on June the 8th, 1725, almost 300 years ago. Take this rule. Whatever weakens your reason, impairs the tenderness of your conscience, obscures your sense of God, or takes off your relish of spiritual things. In short, whatever increases the strength and authority of your body over your mind, that thing is sin to you however innocent it may be in itself. Pretty profound. Whatever increases the strength and authority of your body over your mind, and I would add, I think, another synonym there would be spirit, that thing is sin to you, however innocent it may be in itself. So we come up against this holy God. If you were to keep a record of sins, O God, who could, who could stand? So God not only knows that we are sinners, but he knows what we need. He knows we need to be forgiven. We don't need to cover up or mask our sins. We need to get rid of them. And yoga and TM or the new age or anything else is just a cover-up. It doesn't deal with the root issue. John Wesley had tried everything too. He had an impeccable devotional life. He was up at 5 o'clock the morning that he was converted because he was up every morning at 5 o'clock and engaged in one hour of Bible reading. 
were called Methodists because he belonged to a group of others, including George Whitfield, who later went on to be a very important evangelist as well, who came together at Oxford and methodically read through the scriptures. And that's why they were called Methodists, because they were so methodical about their devotional and spiritual lives. He read the Bible and prayed systematically. And yet, he still did not have a clear conscience with regard to his own sense of sin. He tried to placate God by working for him as a priest, as a professor at Oxford. I had my picture taken beside a statue uh, in Savannah, Georgia, when we were there. We were in Savannah uh, with, uh, with uh, Glenn and, and Sheila Duncan in February. And uh, uh, one of the, if you've been to Savannah, it's a very, uh, one of the early, early uh, colonies, one of the first places that General Oglethorpe uh, colonized. And here in the middle of Savannah is this statue, a, a, a life statue, the size, he was very short, about five feet, five inches tall. And, and here's this statue of John Wesley. And, and all the information about what took place during that season of his life is negative. He came home because he simply didn't fit and because he just got in trouble being there. And he goes home disconsolate because of all that has taken place in Georgia. He went to Georgia as a missionary, hoping that he would deal with some of the issues of his life and could finally get rid of this burden of sin. But none of it had worked. He was still walking around with this sense of estrangement from God. And so when he read those words that morning, you are not far from the kingdom of God, and then went to St. Paul's Cathedral that afternoon and heard the 130th Psalm sung. There was something going to happen that day. So verses 5 and 6, section 3, trust in God. Can God deal with my sin problem? Yes, I trust in you. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits, and in his word I put my hope. My soul waits for the Lord. I love this image. The ancient world the watchman was the, was the protector of the city. Most of the cities in the ancient world were walled. And there would be sentries up on the top of those walls, those watchmen, waiting all night long, doing the night shift, listening for sounds, seeing if there was rustling, if the enemy was going to attack at night, was going to try and break through the wall below where the sentry was stationed and come in through that wall and take over that city. And that watchman would yearn for daylight, would yearn for the sun to come up in the east because they knew that they made it through another night. And their job as protector, as watchman, as guard was once again cared for. They'd done what they were supposed to do. Perhaps you've gone through a hard day or night. I have. Night seems like it's going to last forever. And you think, if I can just make it to morning... And when dawn comes, the sun breaks through in the eastern sky, and you say, I made it. The watchman here that Wesley is thinking about is the watchman of his soul. More than the watchman waits for the morning. More than the watchman waits for the morning. Well, the assurance in God, verses 7 and 8, the wait was not in vain because... Look at the last two verses. And again, put yourself on the afternoon of May 24, 1738 at St. Paul's Cathedral. Wesley hears, O Israel, put your hope in the Lord, for with the Lord is unfailing love, and with him is full redemption. He himself will redeem Israel from all her sins. So that choir sang Wesley's, what has now become his confessional or penitential psalm that afternoon. But later that same day, that evening, he went to a little chapel on Aldersgate Street in London, England. Uh, the Morrison family has been there. They've actually seen this little chapel. 
I have not. I would love to see it someday. In the evening, John Wesley writes in his journal, this is his own words now, I went very unwillingly to a society, now we would call that a chapel or a congregation, in Aldersgate Street, where one was, where a person was reading Luther's preface to the epistle to the Romans. Now, uh, I've read a lot of dry stuff uh, in my preparation and during the years of seminary and following. Uh, Martin Luther was, uh, of course, the 16th century, the early 1500s, approximately 200 years before Wesley. And Luther's preface to the epistle to the Romans is as dry as you can possibly imagine. This man was not preaching. He was reading from this, literally from this book, this commentary of Martin Luther on the epistle to the Romans. But it didn't matter what, how dry it was. About a quarter before nine, while he was describing the change which God works in the heart through faith in Christ, I felt my heart strangely warmed. I felt I did trust in Christ, Christ alone, for my salvation. And an assurance was given me that he had taken away my sins, even mine, and saved me from the law of sin and death. Now, if I was to stop right now and ask this congregation how many of you have had that kind of an experience, whether it was one moment in time like it was for Wesley or a series of events over a lifetime as it has been for me. I'm guessing that a great majority, perhaps all of us, would be able to say, I know that my sins are forgiven. I know exactly what Wesley wrote about. I felt I did trust in Christ, Christ alone for salvation. And an assurance was given me that he had taken away my sins, even mine, Notice the emphasis, and save me from the law of sin and death. And out of that comes the rise of the Methodist movement and the particular emphasis of Methodists on the importance, the necessity of our sins being forgiven and the reality that we can know that our sins are forgiven, that as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. So how do we deal with sin? How do we deal with estrangement from God? How do we know that our sins are forgiven? Well, we cry out to God. We affirm who God is. We know who we are. We are sinners in need of a Savior. We trust in God. More than the watchman waits for the morning, we believe that God will answer, that he will act on our behalf in our, the forgiveness of our sins and in the story of our life as it unfolds. For with him there is unfailing love, and with him there is full redemption. I've known the story of uh, John Wesley since I was a kid. And I learned it uh, and the nuances of it uh, in university and in seminary. And it is one of the defining parts of who I am as a person. I understand my own Christian journey through that lens of the forgiveness of sins and the assurance that God has forgiven my sins. And as I have lived my life as a pastor now for 35 years, I live my life listening to stories. That's, that's what my life is all about. And I give thanks to the Lord that I have been trusted with so many stories, literally thousands of stories that I've been trusted with. I am increasingly convinced as I grow older and as I live longer in this life of ministry that most issues, not all issues, let me be clear about that, but most issues in our lives could be if not solved, certainly begin to be addressed if we would recognize that sin 
is at the heart of the issue. We've grown unaccustomed to hearing that word. We've grown unaccustomed to saying, you know what, there's sin in my life, I've got to deal with it. We've grown unaccustomed to looking inside and saying what is actually at the root of what is going on in this situation. And once we get that starting point right, which is, I think, what Wesley's contribution is to Christian thought. He was doing all the right things. But the missing piece was personal knowledge, experience of his own sins forgiven and the assurance that God had forgiven his sins. And he's 35 years old, and he's done all the things that he has done up to that point. But it isn't until he nails that down that the rest of the story of his life unfolds. Once that becomes the starting point in the conversation, no matter whether it's a conversation with me or with a family member or with God, once it becomes the starting point in the conversation, progress can be made. But again, we're reticent to call it what it is. It's sin. Back to what Susanna Wesley wrote to her son. If it puts your body in control of your mind and your spirit, then it's sin. Wesley, on the evening of May the 24th, 1738, got at the root issue. And out of that experience that he had with the living God, 300 years later, we're talking about him. So let me say in closing one more time what I'm growingly understanding as I live my pastoral life. I'm convinced that most of the issues, not all of them for certain, but lots of the issues that we deal with in our lives, that I deal with in my life, could be dealt with. Not perhaps, again, I'm, I'm, I'm not saying in every situation because I know there are exceptions to the rule. But many of the issues in my life could be addressed if I recognized that sin is at the heart of the issue that I'm dealing with. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for the reality of your sinless life and your complete and perfect atonement for our sins. It's on that basis, Lord Jesus, that we live our lives on a day-to-day -day basis, believing that your sacrifice on the cross was sufficient for the sins of the whole world, and that as we individually come to that recognition that it is sin that controls our lives and estranges us from you, that when that happens, then when we deal with that issue, then the rest of our lives flow freely and flow without, um, without the kinds of things that, that will take place unless we deal with this issue. Perhaps there's someone here this morning, Lord Jesus, that has never asked for their sins to be forgiven. Uh, John Wesley literally crisscrossed the Atlantic Ocean, looking for this problem to be solved in his own life. And it was at a little chapel in an obscure place in the city of London where someone was doing something that wasn't what we would consider to be the way for people to come to faith in Christ today, that he responded. And that you did what he was looking for for all those years. Lord, if there be someone here this morning that can't say without reservation that they know that their sins are forgiven, I pray that this would be the day 
that they would say yes to you because you're, we're not looking for you. The reality is you're looking for us. It is your grace that is constantly flowing in our direction. We may think that we're on that search, and in reality we are, but it is you that is speaking into our hearts and wooing us to yourself. So, Lord, just be in every aspect of each of our lives and uh, help us to be uh, brutally honest with ourselves and with you, knowing that with Israel there is full redemption. You will redeem Israel from all our sins. And we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.